Hey everyone, welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donnie Williams. Great oh, <laughs> Yes, it is. Um, we have quite the show for you. Uh, we have quite a bit that we're going to try to pack into the next hour, so we're going to kind of get to it. But before I get started, I hope that everyone who's tuning in, no matter how you're tuning in for the next hour, thank you so much for joining us. And today we are going to be talking about family tree DNA. And um, <clears throat> congratulations to, to Donia for, for reaching out to family tree to get our wonderful guests. So I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing Sherman is an experienced genealogist specializing in African-American genetic genealogy and DNA research. He serves as a co-administrator for the EM2 in AYDNA haplogroup projects, contributing to the advancement of genetic knowledge within these communities. Sherman is deeply committed to bringing, to bridging the genetic divide and uncovering new haplogroups in under-tested populations, particularly among Africans and the, and the diaspora. Currently, Sherman works as a vital member of the Family Tree DNA Groups Department, where he acts as a liaison between researchers and the company. His role involves facilitating communication and collaboration, ensuring the successful implementation of DNA testing for research purposes. Additionally, Sherman has been invited to deliver presentations at national and local events, sharing his expertise on utilizing DNA testing and genetic genealogical research. Courtney Eberhardt, the marketing coordinator at Family Tree DNA, is driven by a profound passion for genealogy, fueled by her personal journey as an adoptee with roots in the LDS church. Through research with Family Tree DNA, she has also been able to uncover her husband's indigenous roots in Mexico and provide context for his origins. In her spare time, she finds joy in connecting with her family and friends during cookouts, cheering for the Houston Astros, and cherishing her role as a dedicated full-time parent to a two-year-old. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And can I just say... Courtney's my new best friend. I just want y'all to know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and can I just say kudos, Courtney, for being a full-time parent to a two-year-old? Because that is just <laughs> undiluted energy. <laughs> you are so right about that. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Remember <laughs> one day you're gonna be me. Go back. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming, baby. It's coming. <laughs> so I thought it would be a good idea to kind of introduce kind of what your roles are at Family Tree DNA to add some context to the conversation for the audience. And Sherman, I thought I would start with you. If you can talk a little bit about your role and, and kind of what's involved in a in a day to day basis. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so my main role uh, is, you know, I work in a groups department. So Family Tree DNA has over about 10,000 research projects and we have about over 7,000 researchers. So my role is typically pretty much to kind of facilitate, you know, the things that they want to do with the company, uh, whether it's, you know, to get um, someone added to like a discovery page who's like a famous person that they're related to. Um, I could be, you know, processing a bulk order. Maybe someone wants to order, uh, you know, 100 tests or something to that effect. Or I may be working with a researcher who, you know, wants to contact the company and, you know, test a whole bunch of people. And maybe I'll um, go back and forth between, uh, you know, maybe I might try to work out a deal in terms of pricing between them and the company. I also, uh, mo a lot of, most of my co other contributions are with the research and development department. And so that's where I may search for academic papers that have been written. So we'll upload those genetic studies to our tree uh, for matching purposes. And I also have my other um, independent projects that I work on, like recruiting. Like right now, we need some Aboriginal testers. So I've been reaching out to some Australians, some Aboriginal people to try to get them to test, uh, just to kind of add them to our tree and see if we could generate new haplogroups. I've also tested maybe some famous people, like I was more recently, I tested Muhammad Ali's brother, you know, to try to rule out a genetic connection that they have. I have also other research projects where I'm trying to um, track some of the early Africans that came here in um, the 1600s. So I've been looking for direct descendants uh, to test a direct descendant and add them to our tree as notable connections. Um, and so I've tested a, a quite a few people um, where I've added um, like the Combo family. I'm going to add the Mozingo family next. And I've also um, 
been testing some other direct descendants of uh, like some people in Durham, North Carolina, who were part of the Black Wall Street. So I've been testing mm-hmm. their descendants to also get them added to our tree. So that's some of the things that I've been working on right there. Cool. Well, Kumbu and Muzingo, those are my people. So I will be following those two. And um, there's another uh, Afri- kind of well-known African-American genealogist, Andre Kearns. Yep. I will definitely let him know because those are his people too. So we'll be following. I just wanted to make sure I heard those numbers correctly. Also, Sherman, I have Australian um, background, so I may be able to help. That's on my father's side. Oh, really? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we yeah, might definitely. need to talk about that. Yes, certainly. Uh, actually, Andre is the one who contacted me uh, about getting them added. So kudos to him for doing that. <laughs> well, thank you, cousin Andre. And I just quickly wanted to confirm those two numbers. So, seven thousand researchers, ten thousand projects. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. So I think that's something that's been largely underutilized by African Americans because they don't really know that we have those research projects out there. So it's quite possibly you can just Google FTDNA and the surname that you're searching for, and there may be a project there. And if you look inside that project, you actually may see some direct descendants from the um, let's say enslavers that you've been researching anyhow to see where they've already done some wide DNA testing or DNA testing in general. So that's one of the biggest things that we offer for our, from our company is the fact that we have uh, research projects and some of them are ran by some of the best researchers in the world who have an interest in that. And so, yeah, that's correct. And Courtney, before we get to you and your role, someone just asked a really excellent question. Um, One of our audience members, Randy, asked, I know a couple of people in Australia and New Zealand, Maori connections, that would be New Zealand. um, Should they just take tests or should they contact you in advance? Yeah, they can uh, actually... Yeah, they can actually go ahead and test, or you can also contact me, and I can help facilitate that as well. Great. Thank you very much. And Courtney, what is a day in the life of a marketing coordinator at Family Tree DNA? Oh, gosh. Um, Changes day by day. Uh, There's a lot of... I like to communicate with our audience with all the different social media platforms we have. So you're getting comment replies on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, We just launched on Threads, and that's very off the cuff, but we're, we're on there. So if you're talking with Family Tree DNA in the social media realm, you're probably talking with me. Um, so I like to do that. I like to see what our customers are doing and kind of get a, a feeling of what are we focusing on right now and how can we better help you. Um, a lot of we've been working on collecting customer stories. So if there's any success stories or any surprising finds that people have uh, while they've tested with Family Tree DNA, we're trying to collect those and show people who may have not heard of us or are on the fence of, should I test with Family Tree DNA or not? We're trying to collect those stories to show people, you know, this is what's happened for others who have tested with us. Um, and then on top of it, just content marketing, a big focus that we've pushed for the past probably year and a half is education. Um, we're aware that a lot of our reports are very science-based. And for me, you know, um, I, I was adopted. I grew up in the LDS church. I know genealogy pretty well, but I had never heard of centimorgans. I'd never heard of haplogroups. I'd never heard of the genetic part of genetic genealogy. So I like to take that perspective and try to think, okay, if somebody's never heard of us and this is just popping up on my feed from the algorithm, what are things that I would want to see that would help me understand what family tree DNA does? Um, and one of the biggest things that I didn't know until I started here Family Tree DNA was actually the first company to sell uh, commercial DNA tests. A lot of people think 23andMe and Ancestry were the first, but we were the first people to actually um, provide that service to the market. And so educating people like we've been doing the longest and we have our own lab where we test everything. We're doing the science ourselves, I think lends a lot of credibility. So trying to take that information and, and let people who haven't heard of us know about it is a lot of what my focus is. And the other question I had for both of you, and I'm going to, it'll be interesting to get your different perspectives on this. I'm going to start with you, Sherman. Um, What is it, you know, out of all of the major kind of commercial uh, autosomal DNA testing companies, and I guess um, Y-DNA and MT-DNA is becoming more popular, what is it that makes family tree DNA distinctive and different? 
Uh, yeah, well, the fact that, uh, of course, we have our own lab. I don't think any other genetic testing company actually has their own lab. Um, but also that we're actually the only company that offers all three types of DNA tests. And we offer transfers. So if you test it with Ancestry, 23andMe, et cetera, you can transfer over into the database for free and get matches. I also understand you could upload to MyHeritage as well. But I think that was one of the main things is that we offer all three types of DNA testing. And so that's what typically sets us apart from um, a lot of other companies is that they focus on one thing. Okay. Well, and Courtney? Um, I mean, Sherman summed that up really well. I think I would just add that the group projects is a big aspect that um, we want to make sure that we're highlighting more um, because of the access, the just the uniqueness of the group projects. You're not necessarily just in a group talking with people about a common goal, but the, the tools that we provide in group projects that you're able to analyze your DNA compared with people with similar SNPs or similar geographical locations or um, oh, there's so many different surnames. And so the fact that you're able to compare all of them, I think, also sets us apart in this group experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that even though the controversy is a little bit old, but, you know, we had the whole uh, furore with JetMatch and privacy and releasing information to law enforcement and all of that kind of a thing. What is Family Tree DNA's policy on, on privacy? Sherman, I don't know if you want, because I'm fairly new. Um, oh. I actually just started a year and a half ago, and Sherman was teaching me about this. So, uh, In terms of privacy, I mean, I mean, we don't really share your DNA, like sell it to another company. Um, we are, the company is involved with uh, law enforcement testing. Uh, they work with law enforcement. And so, but customers have the option, uh, like myself, I'm not really interested in you know, um, I do genealogy and DNA, so I'm not really interested in law enforcement stuff. So, like, we give you the option to actually turn that off if, you, if you're not interested in coming up in a law enforcement search. Um, so, yeah, we do work with law enforcement in terms of uh, helping them kind of solve cases or whatnot. But overall, the company is, uh, they don't necessarily sell your data to any other company, but they do um, have a relationship with law enforcement. Customers have the option to turn that off if they're not interested in helping out with that. Um, mm -hmm. And even with law enforcement um, searches, um, typically uh, African, I know this is kind of interesting, but African Americans typically don't um, come up in the, you know, most of that is centered around, you know, because European people, they do far more testing than we do. So I think it's been largely more beneficial for them to help solve cases than it has been for us. Because when we're not, we're kind of behind in terms of being in DNA databases. Excellent. You guys, and have, actually, um, you guys have actually a smaller group of people that test with you. Do you know why that is? Um, well, I think because, you know, I think because we hadn't really, we're mostly into Y DNA testing. So the company started off in like 1999, 2000. And so, I mean, t prices are, um, you know, a, a huge factor in terms of like how much they cost. But I, I, even before I, I started there um, or, I, you know, I transferred my results over. So, I mean, I hear feedback from like African-Americans and basically uh, a lot of their feedback was, you know, with our company was that because we're still largely still doing autosomal testing, African-Americans are, um, you know, and even now we're trying to get more involved in the advanced DNA testing, but, you know, a lot of people are concerned about matches. You know, they may have tested with our company and they may not had loads of matches, autosomal matches and things like that. So I think, you know, because our company years ago, you know, they started really focusing and honing in on advanced DNA testing, like Y DNA testing and MT DNA testing. It's like now we're kind of, you know, trying to fill in some of the gaps with autosomal testing that would make it more enticing for people to, you know, to to uh, test with our company. So I, I think it's largely because of, you know, years ago, there probably wasn't many people where anybody that worked for our company that had, you know, 
um, African Americans or other people in mind in terms of what they needed, etc. When I first started, you know, let's say most African Americans, they want to know their ethnic percentages and breakdown if they're doing autosomal testing. But when I started, we might have had four African populations, north, south, east, and west, for autosomal DNA testing. And so we upgraded that to the new My Origins, where we have loads more African reference populations. So we've been trying to do some more things over the years to kind of play catch up in terms of autosomal testing. Um, and so even with Y-DNA testing, you know, there's so many genetic gaps that exist um, between uh, with Africans and people of the diaspora is that that was just another thing is that, you know, people take a Y-DNA test and they want to get matches. But, you know, it's a, a genealogy is a, is a group effort. And so that's what I try to tell people a lot of times is that everybody is going to have to do their part you know, and kind of fill in the gaps for us to cat, even remote, even start to catch up with other um, ethnicities or even haplogroups like our haplogroup and I haplogroup. Those are most, uh, those are, uh, those, uh, they do a lot more DNA testing than people with African haplogroups. And so, you know, we just have to, I mean, we have to ultimately, you know, so we hear customers' concerns about pricing. So that's something that we have in mind. So in the next couple of years, we do plan to reduce pricing um, and, um, and kind of just start filling in gaps where the company might have missed years ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I can appreciate if you have your own in-house lab and then you're actively trying to increase the, the, the data sets, the, the actual individuals that, whose DNA that you're comparing ours to, that's not a cheap endeavor. Right. And I guess my, my question to you is, specifically talking about collecting African samples, what are some of the challenges in terms of going to Africa and identifying populations that you want to test and then getting access to those populations? Yeah, that's been a huge challenge because we've, we, you know, we have relationships with African researchers where we're sending them kits every month um, and test people within those populations. And so there are some times where we may, be, may work with a researcher and, you know, but they don't want us to release that data publicly because they maybe want to write a genetic paper on it or some things like that. So there are some issues where, you know, we have connections and we've been testing Africans. And so there might be a hiccup where we may have loads of quite a few African samples there that are just sitting there private because we hadn't got permission from the researcher to release those publicly. So that's one of the things. And so Africa, you know, for the most part, even with with genetic companies, you know, we're able to now use uh, genetic studies and that helps us out a whole lot. But there's new genetic studies being published almost daily for like European haplogroups, but they don't come out as often for African haplogroups. And even the papers that come out that are African based, a lot of times those researchers, they lock the paper where we don't even have access. So you may be a match to um, a sample that was taken doing one of their research studies, but you would never know because you, you know, they're not necessarily giving you access to the paper. And so for times where we've had, we've gotten access to those papers, like I uploaded one genetic study a while it was for over 200, to over 200 Angolan samples. And so we added those to the tree for matching. And so people who took a DNA test were better able to kind of get a, idea of what region in Africa they come from based off of their genetic closeness to those African samples. And so those are some of the things that we're trying to do. But um, but yeah, uh, genetic studies, there's not many genetic studies being placed on African that are being done on with Africans right now. And at the same time, there's not a whole lot of um, Africans who are doing indigenous Africans who are doing Y DNA, mtDNA testing. So that's where the genetic studies really help us out. But at the same time, I've also continuously been trying to reach out to Africans in different parts of Africa and maybe send them DNA tests uh, over there and see if we can get those, get more people testing and uploading to our database. That's amazing. Um, I know that when my mom, my mom, I had my mom on all on everything. So she's on Family Tree as well. But on 23 I mean, we ended up getting um, a DNA match as like a third cousin to um, to an African, and they were shocked because they they, they were shocked because they were the first gen. They thought that they were the first generation of Africans over here. 
So wow. they had they actually had no no clue of how we were related. And to be a third cousin, you know, they felt very close. It felt very close to them. Yeah, that's a pretty good match. Third cousins. Yeah. You, know, you guys are probably sharing around a second great grandparent. It could be a bit exactly. further back where y'all make sure a third, but that's still a great match with a continental African. But that's what we really need is to, you know, try to figure out ways to get them to test more and so i have a few researchers i've been working with so what i've been doing is i'll i'll test some africans and we'll just give them a family finder test just to kind of start shoring up our autosomal database but with that we're also able to test their um haplogroups groups as well and so that would that better um enables other y dna testers to see if they're actually a match to anyone like that wow <laughs> So, Courtney, I am sure that as a marketing coordinator, you are asked to produce copy and contents that's quite scientific in nature or could be complicated with lingo and jargon. How do you make difficult concepts and difficult kind of technical language accessible so that everyone can understand? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I did a couple col uh, college classes on biology, so I like to say that I know a little bit, but really it's nothing compared to what our uh, research and development team, they are probably annoyed with the amount of messages that I send them. Um, there was a, a study that just came out recently and I was trying to figure out how, you know, they're talking about the, uh, what was it, the MLOGenin gene and X and Y, and I don't understand it, but I want to post it because it's so popular. Um, they had the Iron Man, I don't know if, if y'all seen this article that came out, but they had tested the the AMEX and AMEY, they had tested for those two genes and only the X chromosome came back. So they were like, oh, it's not the Iron Man, it's the Iron Woman. I was like, this is awesome. But I wanted to post it, but I knew that was going to be one of the first questions. Well, how can you tell that it's a woman? Just if there's X, how does that rule out Y? And so I went to them, you're on Paul, Miguel, I'll message him sometimes. I mean, there's a whole Slack channel of pretty much just me asking you know, genetics for dummies. Like, can y'all explain to me what this is? And so they'll kind of go through it. Um, also our lab, you know, they have, we have panels with our lab and I'll be like, can you explain this? And I'll keep asking these questions and keep asking these questions until it's to a point where I'm like, if I can understand it and I'm very new to all of this, then our audience will be able, be able to understand it. Our audience is, is incredibly intelligent and I say all the time that they know more than I do. So if I it can get it to a level that I understand it, then I know that they're going to know exactly what we're talking about. Um, the other thing that we do is we have a content committee where for our blog posts, and we have a lot of people from our R&D team, from our product team, from a bunch of different teams who are writing blogs for us, and they'll go through and they it gets very scientific. Um, and so I'll go through and kind of try to reword things um and I'll, I'll ask questions hey can you explain this can we, you know five whys break it down and then when we get to a point where again i can understand it i'm like okay then let's change this to this and, and we can put it out there so it's a lot of collaboration between me trying to learn it and our, our r d team and our products in our lab excellent and just like any other dna analysis company you guys have developed proprietary kind of technology and tools so between the two of you, um, what are some of the tools that exist already on Family Tree DNA that everyone should be using? And if you can give us a sneak peek at what's on the horizon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, that's one of the things that I think is beneficial for our, like we have autosomal tools where you can use a chromosome browser, chromosome painter. Um, those are already in existence. And even within the group projects that we have, there's also some other tools. Uh, that um that customers can use as well. Like I think there's a chromosome browser or something else within the group projects, but I think that's more like administrators um, that they use. Um, do you know any other tools, Courtney? Uh, my favorite is the chromosome browser. Um, and then there's also if you go into your my origins and you look at your matches, you can also um, look and compare the matches and kind of compare the segments. And Roberta Estes, she she writes a great blog. She's uh, she works with us as well as a consultant, and she breaks them down a lot. She's one of the people that I'm always asking questions to. 
But um, that was one of her things. She wrote a blog about finding Native American ancestry and 13 ways to um, really hone in on, on your Native American ancestry. And that was one of the ones was comparing your matches and then looking through the chromosome browser and comparing, okay, so where, what segments of DNA and through finding the, you know, if you pick seven people, seven matches, and four of you all have shared DNA on this one chromosome, on this one segment, being able to find, okay, so we're probably related on this line, and then we're probably related on this line. I think that's probably the coolest one. That's one that I haven't seen at other companies that I personally really enjoy. Yeah, and some other tools that we have on the horizon, um, we have quite a few. So we have the Million Mito Project. That's where we're working on... Um, because I don't think the Mito tree has been updated since like 2016 or 2017. So we're, um, I think we took the samples from the National Genographic Project. So we're incorporating those samples into what we already have. And so the research and development team right now is working on a, the Million Mito project where we're trying to generate We'll take all those tests and reanalyze them so we'll be able to generate new haplogroups for the mitochondrial side, just like we're kind of doing for the Y-DNA side right now. Um, I think in about the next, probably within the next month or so, we should have a haplocaller coming out. I don't know the exact date of release, but um, it's comparable pretty much like when you test with 23andMe, you take a autosomal DNA test and they provide you with your haplogroups. That's what we'll be giving uh, people that have took the family finder test, they'll get uh, automatically get their haplogroup assignments. And another really cool project that we have that should be released soon, is called the Globe Trotter, Globe Trekker. Globe so, Trekker. Yeah, so it's pretty, it's like a really new um, migration map. I did a, a mini snip of that during my Roots Tech presentation, but uh, pretty much it will help people like me, or let's say anyone, pretty much you'll be able to look at the migration path um, from, of course, Y chromosome Adam all the way to where your modern day SNP is. So with that, you know, it'll take you from where, you know, of course, the Y chromosome Adam was from and you look at the general SNP mutations and the, and it also shows the time it took them or uh, where the mutation might have took place. But the Globe Trekker would actually show people like myself, you know, where your direct origins probably come from. So I, you know, mine, my direct origins are from probably Congo and Angola. And so when I type my SNP into that globe trekker, uh, it actually shows my ma migration path into um, like the Congo. So mm -hmm. that's going to be really cool. And that should be coming out pretty soon. I think customers really like that. I want to add on that real quick as well. For me, what I really like about the globe trekker, and there's sneak peek screenshots on our most recent blog about updating your earliest known ancestor, if anybody wants to go see those. But it's a visual way to be able to see it. Um, and you can see in those screenshots, it's a map and it will show you where this SNP was found. This, then you're able to kind of visually see where your ancestors were, were migrating. The second thing I want to say is, and this is why we put the blog post out, the way to get the most out of this new feature that's coming out is to make sure that anybody who has tested with family tree DNA updates their earliest known ancestor information with their location and their birth and death dates. That, that information right there is key not just for Globe Tracker, but for a lot of the tools and features that we have across the platform. Keeping, you know, when you make these breakthroughs and you're finding somebody even further back on the line, making sure that you update that information. And that just helps with not only you being able to see these features, but it also helps other people in your groups and, and your matches. They'll see a name, they're like, oh, okay. And it helps their, their genealogy as well. And as Sherman said, it's all a group effort. Cool. So, well, okay, I have a... Um so my thing is, is this, one of the things that I've been questioned about, you know, African-Americans always say they have Indian in their family. <laughs> How many Native Americans have, have tested? Because I'm, I'm, I'm interested in understanding that because my mom said the same thing, but she has maybe 1% Native American DNA mm -hmm. that's popping up. Well, the average African-American, I think is about 2% Native American. Um, on average, I think from like studies that they've taken. So we actually have a number of, um, you know, Native American reference samples that uh, our population geneticist, Paul, he uploaded them 
Um, and so he might have gotten some from academic papers and some other places uh, and, and with um, just Native American testers in general, because, like I said, we have researchers, you know, they may some someone may be down somewhere in Chiapas, Mexico, and and he wants to research the, the population down there for Native American ancestry. And um, so we have and so he may do testing on some of them. So we also have samples from regular testers as well. So there's enough testers within our database and even our reference population where, you know, if you have a Native American segment, we should be able to detect that. You know, uh, Roberta Estes and, and other people um, are part of our group segments for the Mary Indian Project. It's one of the group projects and it, it's got a good chunk of people. I can't tell you the number off the top of my head, but we also have a lot of resources, but Roberta Estes is involved with a lot of that because she does have Native American ancestry. So does Janine Cloud, um, and they've written blogs for us. and They've put out content for us um, in regards to that. So we do have a lot of resources for Native American ancestry as well. Excellent. So one thing that keeps cropping up is those of us who have deep ancestry in the southeastern part of the states, and I'm specifically thinking South Carolina and Georgia, um, in our DNA results, in our DNA matches, we're seeing a lot of links with people from the Caribbean and sometimes even from South America. And even doing paper research for some of my clients, I've noticed like a little kind of a little slave triangle between Florida, Cuba, Brazil, Mexico, and then back into Florida, that kind of traffic. So a lot of us do carry small percentages of, you know, DNA from Bermuda, Barbados, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, all, you know, all the way into over, over into Brazil. Are those populations of people that you're, you're actively testing as well as part of the African diaspora? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I've reached out to a number of people who are in the Caribbean. So I remember a research study being published. Um, it was, there were some bones that were found in the Caribbean. Uh, they were some of the early Africans to come here back in the 14 or 1500s. And so, um, you know, we got a hold of that sample. Then we found that this person from Haiti or somewhere in the Caribbean was actually a match to one of those uh, men that was found. And so, you know, oh, wow. he was already tested in our database. I contacted him. I let him know that he was a match to uh, one of the men that was found, um, some of the, to the bones that were found. So, yeah, we actually have um, a quite a good number of Africans from the diaspora that also they test as well. And, and, and if I see uh, like a genetic find with any of them, which I have, I've seen a couple, because there was another study that was published, um, academic study. This was also with the first wave of Africans to enter Mexico back into the 1400. I just can't remember the study. But when we uploaded the samples, you know, we still found, um, you know, Africans and people, the uh, um, Caribbeans that are also a match to, you know, some of those bones that were even found in Mexico as well. So yeah, there are some testers in our database and we try to test them as well because we understand that, you know, that's why I always speak about the diaspora and not just African-Americans, but Caribbeans and people like that as well, because there is a genetic connection. You know, I know my grandmother has some third or fourth cousins from Honduras and, uh, you know, they, they don't have anything within their history about, you know, mm. anyone coming to the United States. But, you know, I think that just area around the PD area, North and South Carolina and some other places, uh, you know, I did some research and saw there was an influx of maybe some Caribbeans coming. Well, as we stress on this show, the only difference between us African descended people in this country and any other within the Americas was a boat stop. That's correct. And, we, and we that's it. That in DNA, truly. Mm -hmm. so we have um, our, our, our audience they got questions man <laughs> they got questions um andrea kinder she well she didn't go into detail on her so i'm saying her name simply because i would like for her to go into detail on it but she said that she did not have a great result with family tree dna back in 2012 i know the two of you are like what was your result what do you mean by that so Andrea, please go and you know give us some um, detail on that. But LJ Long said that his brother has a Y match with an earliest ancestor, John Going, eighteen forty three. What can I do with this? Um, could you repeat that? So Goins is pretty popular. Can you repeat that question again, though? Yes, I, I posted oh, I a right bit. There. 
Yeah, example, my brother has a wide match with an early ancestor, John Goins, 1843. What can I do with it? Um, it, well, you may be related to him. You could be a direct descendant or you could come from, you know, like a parallel branch. But the fact that he's, you know, he you share a genetic signature, you know, that does provide some information. So it, it really depends on like what level you've tested at and what level they've tested at. And based off of, you know, the genetic signature, let's say if both of you guys took a we could say Y111 and he's showing up at the genetic distance of one or something like that. And that's a really good clue that you're probably a direct descendant. So, um, so you can actually contact me. Or I can give you my information and I can look at the result. I could probably, you know, give you more pertinent information once I actually see mm -hmm. how you match, because there might be a genetic distance that are going, that's going on. And so once I look at it, I could probably definitely give you um, better feedback. Um, and all I have to say is John Goins is a, because it's also going, Goins, it spells any number of ways. It is a rough name. To, yeah. Just the name John Goins itself is rough. Um, and something else for people to think about, I'm just going to quickly throw this out there. If, for instance, we're talking about the free family of color Goins, we have to remember that surnames came from both our female ancestors and our male ancestors. I'm a descendant of the Kumbos, the Kumbo family but through Elizabeth Kumbo. She kept her name. She had children with an unknown Caucasian man. All of her kids took her last name. So don't be surprised if, you know, you like, I'm, a, you know, you're still a Goins. I um, you can still be proud of your name, but don't be surprised if that YD, if you're coming from a free family of color, don't be surprised if that YDNA throws you off in a completely different direction than, than the Goins family. Yep. That's correct. That you said that because Andrea just responded. She said she did the test, but mostly got European matches and two known relatives. So uh, I guess that was what her issue was. Yeah, that's just another thing about like you know our database is that, um, you know. We're, you're only good as your like database at the end of the day. So that's why we, we do offer free transfers. But if if we don't have any closer matches to you um, then that have tested with our company, then, you know, they're not going to show up as a match. So there's probably just some gaps there, Andrea, um, where you are probably picking up more uh, white matches than African matches only because just the, the lack of, honestly, that probably lack of African matches in our autosomal database at this point in time. So that would, and so that's just another reason why, you know, even just doing genealogy, you know, they just encourage you to kind of put your eggs in a couple baskets, whether you test an ancestry, you upload to our company, et cetera. But I don't know. I'm assuming you did an autosomal test, Andrew, I presume. Otherwise, it could be based off of your haplogroup, but you can add mm -hmm. another comment and see if we're going in the right direction. Well, that's a good point, because for my Jewish family, um, I got a because of the tools that you have and the DNA paint, DNA chromosome painter, awesome. Yeah. It's just, just awesome. But that was an initial tool. Well. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know where it is. I don't know who it is. And, but she definitely connects to the going. So there may be some projects that you guys are going to be connecting me to because I don't know anything about the going. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's um, a project there. I'm sure. I think um, I saw someone post that link who had a last name Goins to the F Henry. I think Henry might have posted that link to a Goins mm -hmm. project. Yeah, people should check that out if you have some matches there. Uh, definitely, you can Google or use his link or Google FTDNA Goins project and see what comes up and take a look and look at the testers there. They might list their oldest known ancestors and and uh, so that may help you out as well. So. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, speaking of unexpected test results, you, especially if you're getting into, you know, uh, Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA, you may identify as one ethnicity. And for this one, I'm going to use, you know, you may identify as Caucasian. You may look at your parents and grandparents and think Caucasian. You do one of these tests, you may have an African haplogroup. Because <laughs> um, again, it's the complexity. I wish that we can have an honest conversation about American history. And, you know, love found a way. No matter how you want, you know, who was loving who, it found a way. Kids were, you know, whether it was legal or not, kids were produced. And sometimes, you know, people changed their identity. It was maybe easier to live as one type of ethnicity than, than the other. Uh, as Donnie and I also say on the show all the time, never take a DNA test lightly. 
I know that they're sold as entertainment or edutainment on television, te- you know, clever TV advertising. But you, we don't know what we're going to get until we swab our cheek or spit in the tube and get those results back. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I had a couple, a number of testers, you know, um, some of them maybe came back with trace amounts of African. Maybe they lived in Alabama and they were white. And so they may call kind of irked, you know, about, you know, just showing up. And so maybe I might go into your match list a little bit and start showing you where you, you know, you have more African-American matches. Or, for example, like you were saying earlier, I think I might even had a Goins tester. Uh, you know, he can't, he was upset that his haplogroup group was African. And, um, and I'm like, he was like, this is not correct. This has to be incorrect right here. You know, I'm, I have zero percentage of European um, African DNA. And I was letting him know, well, you know, you probably had one, at least one African ancestor back in the 1600s. And that might've been your only African ancestor. So although you, you don't have any African now because it's kind of washed out, your genetic signature will always be African. And then I showed him, you know, his match list. I'm like, hey, look at some of your matches. They have the same last name and they're African, African American. So I like that even your name is Goins, for example. I can't remember if that was his name, but I'm like, your last name is Goins. And you have Match's last name Goins. So, you know, that's kind of the tell of the tape right there. And you know, so I think what you're saying is what what you're saying is is that you shut him down because that is probably one of the main issues that a lot of African-American researchers go through when um, they realize that they have connections to black people and they don't, they don't want it. And I think that goes into the question that I kind of asked you earlier today about when that one drop rule kind of disappeared. And basically what you're saying is the one drop rule really should have never existed because <laughs> People were I mean, mixing since they got here. Yeah. Amen. Look at that. Okay. Let me tell y'all how the Lord worked. So <laughs> here's another question for the two of you from Shelly B. Please explain the markers. Um, markers. Markers is like your genetic signature. You may have a DYS 393 and you might have a 13 there. And your next marker might be DYS 454. So those are mutations. So that DYS is a marker or a mutation. So you can call them one of the two. So when you're looking at those numbers, 15, 18, 19 through 21, whatever, those are mutations or markers. And so if you ever took a Y-DNA, so that's what we're comparing. We're not, we're not looking at your ethnicity when you do advanced testing. We're looking at your genetic signature or your markers, and we're comparing them to other people in our database. So that's how we can figure out your, your genetic closeness or relatedness by looking at those mutation or markers. So markers is just another name for mutation. Um, I understand you can't give away proprietary information, nor would I want you to. If you, both of you can answer this question, if you can, what percentage of autosomal DNA testing does family tree DNA test? I know it's not gonna be a hundred, but what percentage? And the same for your mitochondrial DNA and your Y DNA. Um, well, I'm, I'm more familiar with, so when you, I mean, autosomal DNA, you said what percentage that we test? Mm-hmm. Like of the, yeah, I don't know a direct answer for that. I mean, I know we're just autosomal. Of course, you know, autosomal DNA is just looking at both sides of the family going back 150, 200 years. So I don't know what the actual percentage I never thought about that before, but with mtDNA, because we sell like a full sequence mtDNA test, it looks at the coding region. So let's say hypothetically you could test with another company and they may say you have a certain tribe or whatnot. But um, but that's based off of like a really low level mtDNA test. Because MTD, with mtDNA, you have hypervariable regions. You have HBR1, HBR2, and the coding region. So with the coding region, that's the part of the mtDNA where you can find matches within, you know, let's say 500 years or something like that. Um, and so with our mtDNA test, we will actually examine the coding region. So if somebody, two people can take an mtDNA test and, you know, they can, if both of them took a family finder test, well, that's another clue that people may not know about. So if I have two people that take an mtDNA test and we both took a family finder, I might look and see if they're a match on my family finder because that lets me know that we're probably related within the last, you know, 150 years or 200 years or so. Y-DNA, our big Y test sequences about 
75% of the Y chromosome uh, for the mutations that exist. And so that's a, it's called next generation sequencing. So it's a pretty high level type of test where we're seeking out all the known and unknown mutations. But I may have to get back with you um, and ask our population geneticist about the autosomal question that you asked. Oh, well, thank you. And in terms of your matching algorithm, kind of what's the lowest amount of shared center morgans, otherwise people know them as CMs, that you that you kind of report on? Mm, I forgot. Is it seven? Did they upload? Six, I don't know. Is it six or seven. Seven? Could be seven. Yeah. I think we changed it a few years ago. I thought we maybe upped it to nine, but that's something that we I would did. actually... Okay. Yeah, so you they did up, because they, I might have a picture hanging up on y'all wall somewhere because I went in with somebody, you know, really kind of discussing it, which kind of brings me. I, I'm I'm not even gonna lie to you, Courtney. I was I, I, I and for every moment <laughs> that our that that those DNA those types of things are removed from us, it actually removes lines and lines of people. And um, you're, you're muted, Courtney. Courtney. Oh, can you not hear me? Yeah, and I hear you now. Oh, yeah, yeah, but, you yeah, it, 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 it removes lines and lines of people. So when Ancestry turned around and removed, um, got their CMs taken out, it kind of moved, it moved so many people from our line that it was devastating because we were working on a project for a man named Moses Williams who was born in 1769, which we will discuss a little bit here today. But um, when Family Tree DNA did it, I went in and I went in. So there may be a picture of me or at least my name. Someone, if Danya pops up, don't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they did I, upload the threshold. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I just want to say um, it's funny that this is getting brought up just because we did have a customer comment on one of our Facebook posts the other day and one thing about Family Tree DNA is we take customer feedback very seriously um, from any channel where somebody is giving us feedback we share it amongst the whole company for everybody to be able to input um, okay well this is how we can fix this or this is what's coming up to address that um, so we did have somebody ask they wanted us to to make the threshold one send Morgan, which I, I don't know if that's possible, but it was said, I, I think Katie told me it was six or seven. So I don't know if they lowered it again, um, but it should be back down to that. Um, but that I did want to touch on that just briefly. If there's ever, our customer service team is immaculately just incredible, amazing. I will throw all the adjectives at them. Um, if you ever have any questions about your DNA or about your, your account, and they're probably going to get upset because they're going to get inundated now, but they would love to talk to you. Um, we have a chat and we have a number of chats, probably the easiest way to talk to them, but they will sit down and they'll go over your results and answer your questions. And they, I mean, we get raving reviews for our, our reps all the time because they will sit there and make sure that you understand the test that you paid for. So if anybody does have questions, they're available as well. Yeah, and your feedback actually goes back to the higher up. So even the CEO, um, they can see the feedback that we report back from customers. So mm -hmm. you're not really being ignored. If you do have some concerns, just let someone know. And, um, you know, someone's there listening for sure. Mm -hmm. We have a whole Slack channel titled Customer Feedback. And there is not a message that goes in there that does not have responses and replies to it because we take all feedback very seriously. Okay. I wanted to just respond to DG real quick. Um, they asked about the law enforcement, something that you had already stated. And basically, yeah. yes, you can opt out of that particular um, thing if you want to when it comes to that. I just didn't want him to think that we didn't, you know, touch on that already. Mm -hmm. And Donia, didn't you, you had an excellent question in the green room that you wanted to ask. I forgot, what was it? <laughs> I'm, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, so Donia recently had an interesting exchange with someone who said, if you can't share DNA with someone who's not showing as a DNA match on your list. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that's yeah. not. 
Yeah, it's just basic autosomal rules right there. Like I was mentioning, 50% of fourth cousins won't share any DNA. So a certain percentage of even third cousins may not even share any DNA. And then you also have to look into like the segments that are actually being tested, which company you tested for. And, you know, they may only be testing a certain segment on this chromosome, et cetera. So there are, there are some other things involved. But yeah, that question is, she's not correct in the fact that you, you probably will have, and that's where matches in common start to even, you know, become even more beneficial having matches in common. But yeah, no, you, yeah. you can share, you might not share any DNA with plenty of your third or fourth, fourth cousins on, on back. So mm -hmm. uh, you're still related. The best way that I heard it explained was whenever the Beethoven study came out and we were a huge part of that study coming out and finding out that Beethoven wasn't actually a Beethoven. Um, and we added Ludwig van Beethoven as a match to our database, but he's also a connection in our Discover database. And there is a difference. If a match, you're going to be closer to him, but you can still be connected to him on that Y line. And that was just the easiest way that I, I could tell the difference between the two. You can be connected without actually being matched. Wow. So um, Carmen... Because we are, this show is almost over, but Carmen's, um, Carmen's Place had a great question. I've only done Ancestry DNA. How would this test be different? And I think uh, that's an awesome question because, you know, people test all over, so... Yeah, that's correct. Um, so it, it's actually the same. So the test with Ancestry is autosomal DNA test. Family finder test, we just call ours family finder test, but it tests the same exact DNA, which is called an autosomal DNA um, test. So it's the exact same test that you would take with Ancestry. And you could transfer your results over for free if you were interested in to see what type of matches you might have in our database. Mm -hmm. From that standpoint, people may, you know, because women can only do two tests. So you tested with ancestry some people may just transfer their results over and then maybe do an mt dna test if you were if you were a woman uh, because you can only do two types of tests and so that would kind of max you out with testing mt dna mt dna and uh, autosomal of course men could do all three types of dna tests so this is another question that i have what is is there a difference in um accessibility accessibility between people who are just uploading for free and people who have paid? Oh, no, not at all. The only difference is that, oh, go ahead, Courtney. Well, so I was going to say there, there technically is the upload, you're only going to get the matches. So you're not going to get access to the chromosome browser, chromosome painter, my origins. You're just going to get your matches for free. But our autosomal unlock is $19. It's, you know, in comparison to the, the full family finder test, it's it's a lot cheaper. So if you do want access to all of those other tools, it's going to be a $19 unlock. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And that origins, again, from my Jewish ancestry, awesome. Just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, Donia, in the closing minutes of the show, would you like to do the, your special reveal? The project. Because it's my project, it's my baby, and um, you, as you guys know, my my cousin Sheila died a few years ago, and when she died, I was a complete and total mess. And um, but Sheila was a person that would literally um, pay her own money out to purchase DNA kits for other people, so that they can figure out their connection in the Edgefield area. Well, I went to NGS, and when I went to NGS, I ended up meeting these two beautiful people. And um, when I was talking with Sherman and Courtney, Sherman just came out his mouth and said, well, yeah, I'm related to Sheila. I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> so, you know, in, in, the, in the fact of him saying that, and as we were talking about it and everything, Courtney then says, Donya, do you know who you're talking to? And I'm like, I'm talking to Sherman. What, what do you mean? You know? And she says, no, you're talking to the man that can do a whole DNA project for you. So with that being said, in addition to trying to start back up the Sheila, because I still have about $500 that was never spent to purchase kits in the name of Sheila, Mr. Sherman and Miss Courtney have stated that they will run our Moses Williams project. And um, 
I almost cried right there in NGS <laughs> because we need this. We need this whole thing. So it, it, with that being said, the Moses Williams Project sponsored by the Sheila Hightower Allen DNA group, we will be starting that project up with Family Tree DNA. And I am overly excited. <laughs> I, 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 you, y'all just don't know. When I tell you I was standing in that NGS hall, that I was ready to, I was ready to cry. I knew for a fact that Sheila had everything to do with that because she didn't want that to end. I know she didn't want that to end. She know I'm sitting here on this money, trying to figure out what to do with it, trying to get it started again. And you guys, and, and when I tell y'all, Sherman is as laid back as he is right now. Like he is the most laid back person I've ever met. So when he he just looked at me after Courtney, he was like, Do you want to do it? You know, he just looked at me, he was like, Sure, I'll do it. Just like that. No, yeah, yeah. no issue, no, no problem, nothing to that nature, none of that happened. You know, it's it was the most amazing thing. So people who are connected to Edgefield, South Carolina, or the old 96 district get ready because we will be discussing we will be getting this on the ball again we will get it going so that's what we that's that's my baby <laughs> yeah i'm definitely happy to be able to help out and i mean considering i might have a connection to moses as well um that even piqued my interest even more so so i'm definitely on the hunt to try to find a direct man mail with a test just to get moses added as um as a notable connection on our Discover project, so we can write a bio about him and things like mm -hmm. that. So, definitely looking forward to what this project uh, reveals in the future for sure. And just to, to add the caveat, because this is at, this is the old ninety six, and loads of families are interconnected, and it doesn't matter how you identify, eth you know, in terms of ethnicity, everyone's related. So this isn't this isn't necessarily an African American specific project. If you have right. Oh, if you have deep ancestry in the old 96 district of South Carolina, everyone is who's interested in testing their DNA is encouraged to do it. Yeah. That's right. It's for everybody because, I mean, I have a lady now that I'm getting ready to be in contact with real soon who says she is a descendant of Moses and she's Caucasian. Yeah. So. Because mm -hmm. we, you know. we don't know where Thomas Peterson came from. Um, the, the Caucasian Thomas P. Did he come from New Sweden, from Pennsylvania, or did he come from Virginia? Where did he come from? So we, yeah, we have a whole bunch of lines. So I'm so excited about that, and I'm, I'm I just love y'all for this. That's how Courtney became my uh, my sister. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Y'all were talking about like, goosebumps in the expo hall. I was like, oh, this is real. Like I've never met you, but I can feel it here. Like, oh my yeah. god. Yeah, yeah, it was one of the best things that I, I have that I came across me in a very long time. That was that was amazing. It was mm. an extra feeling, and I had that. I I went back to my room and I thank God for that. I prayed on that one, and I did. And I'm so feel so blessed to have you guys a part of this. So Sherman and Courtney, if you can stay with us for a moment. Um, sadly, everyone, we are actually over time. So. We have to love you and leave you. It has been an absolute pleasure spending this hour with you. You know that we will be right back here again next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So until then, I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. And you guys have a great, great day. Have an awesome week. <laughs>